this, of this talk. And it's, it's a grand one, as I said in my email today. So it's a great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia. Uh, Jeremy got his undergrad degree in geology from Augustana College in Illinois and his PhD from uh, Oregon State University. And not long after he finished, he was hired by the Science Museum and he's now the chief scientist there. So let's welcome Jeremy. All yours. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love getting applause for something I haven't done yet. Um, so that's really good. No, uh, so I wanted to make sure that I start by saying, you know, um, what I love about what I do is that I can really trace where I am today back to the experiences I had in a small, uh, a small geology department like this one. And um, I was talking with Brent, you know, kind of, it is, I, ha I had the exact same experience as many of you probably, like finding geology out of all of the things that you could be doing. You got kind of drawn in by some aspect of geology that's just so unbelievably important to you, but maybe not all of your friends. Um, and and uh, uh, I feel for anybody that's in the igneous and metamorphic petrology class right now, because I remember how much of a headache that gave all of my friends um, at Augustana. Um, uh, uh, so anyway, it's just nice to be at a, at a small, um, uh, intimate kind of um, group like this and uh, really appreciate the invitation. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do today is we're going to go through kind of um, broad, broadly, like what is, you know, climate change. You probably are already aware of what's going on. And then part of what my contribution to the climate change story is, and then how that informs um, some of the work that's going on in Richmond. So we'll go kind of in a big arc. We're going to go a bunch of different random directions, and hopefully um, we emerge with a little bit of an opportunity to, to have a few questions and discuss some of this stuff. I'm also happy to answer questions about like career pathways and things like how do you end up working at a science museum, which is a mystery that I am still seeking to understand more myself. But all right, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll kind of tilt it this way so the people in the in internet world can still see me. All right, so first and foremost, I need to uh, oop, I need to admit a person that's sitting out in the waiting room. Geography of climate inequity. We actually have to start um, the whole conversation with some embarrassing childhood photos. Um, so you get an, you get an idea of who I am a little bit more clearly um, beyond my absolute just perfect fashion sense from the 90s because who knew all of that stuff would be like actually popular again um, now um, but and look you know climate change I had the flood pants um, before it was cool really prescient kind of a thing for myself and uh, but the key aspect of this uh, is not the fashion um, uh, uh, or the, the anything else really it's the fish um, I come to climate change research from experiences as I, I had as a kid my dad taught me how to fish his dad taught him how to fish um, and you know that whole kind of familial pathway um, I learned about how to make scientific observations from these trips so um, we would we would look up how much rain there had been the month before we got there and we would actually make predictions about how much a boulder that was exposed uh, in the middle of the lake was going to be relatively inundated based on how much rain had been had happened in the past month. So my dad and I share a really close connection with the ability to go out and observe the natural world um, while taking part in you know an outdoor recreation activity like fishing. And he used to make uh, walleye with eggs, which sounds disgusting, but if you're from the Midwest, that is a, a delicacy for breakfast. Um, and it turns out over the last 150 years, um, lakes in Wisconsin have warmed up to such an extent that the ecosystems have shifted pretty fundamentally from having a large distribution of different types of fish that fill various trophic levels in the lake. Because you can imagine a lake is a really complex ecosystem. It has stuff coming in from the outside during rain events. It has leaf literal kind of stuff falling into it throughout the, uh, the fall and into the spring and the, the overturning of as it warms up, all that kind of stuff, the frost, especially in the northern part of the Midwest, they freeze over for many months and then uncover. Uh, all of those things are contributing to the ecosystem. But looking at the past 150 years, the DNR actually was able to tie really confidently 
that the long-term warming of these ecosystems were what was driving a lack of these uh, walleye uh, to be present in the lakes anymore. And now they're almost totally dominated by bass, largemouth bass, which are trash to eat. They are disgusting. Even though I'm holding one up, you can even see like, that's all we catch now, um, it seems like. Uh, so when I reflect on like what climate change means to me, and I think this is one of the really important things about situating yourself in relation to climate change is like what about my day-to-day -day life or my identity is threatened by the changes occurring because of climate change and biggest one to me is that I can't share I will not be able to share the same experiences with my children that my parents shared with me uh, fundamentally different kinds of uh, uh, experiences and then thinking about things like uh, other families, especially in other parts of the United States, like even here in Virginia, we have the some of the fastest warming streams uh, uh, ecosystems that are actually driving the brook trout to be very threatened because of climate change. So it's not just northwestern Wisconsin in the middle of nowhere. It's happening uh, ar around the environmental community. But then what I hope to get you uh, acquainted with here today is a little bit more about what climate change means for us in Virginia and how that is disproportionately distributed among people that live in communities around not only Virginia, but across the country. So as you all um, are probably very aware of is that climate change is occurring. Global warming is brought on by the long-term accumulation of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What we're looking at here is global temperatures for the last 150 years or so. Um, and you can look at each individual bar on this chart corresponds to a year. And the color corresponds to how weird that temperature was globally versus the long-term average. Blues, cooler than normal. Reds, warmer than normal. On the left is a long time ago. The right is the year that we wish we could all forget. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> But the, uh, the key thing here is that the, the climate system is unequivocally uh, warming and it's unequivocally due to human emissions of heat trapping gases from uh, burning fossil fuels. You'd have to be close to 40 years old to have lived on a planet when the global monthly temperature was below the 20th century average. So anyone here below 40 years old, me included, have lived on a climate changed planet and we are the ones that are inheriting it. Um, uh, and so we, we have to be serious about what is necessary. What will it take for us to mitigate um, the risks associated with climate change? Because right now we know that the decisions that are being made today play out for the next hundred years. And what, what kind of future we have is dependent on a variety of different strategies for mitigation of these heat trapping gases in cities like Williamsburg, like Richmond, regardless of whether you want to call that an actual city or not, <clears throat> we need to, and this is now in the IPCC, you can lean on this as this is the statement of fact from the IPCC, that many of the things that we can do in cities revolve around how we plan and accommodate for growth in our cities. By the end of the century, most already in America, most people live in cities. Globally, by the mid part of the century, most people will live in cities. And I mean over 50, 60, 70% of the population. So how we choose to make our cities more efficient, more sustainable, and more accommodating to everyone is going to be the way that we can lower the, uh, the per capita emissions within those systems. That includes denser, closer, more compact housing. That leaves more space on the outside for things like parks and adventure spaces. Fewer cars, which is ironic because I had to drive here. I wish more than ever that I could just hop on a, a train in downtown Richmond and then just get off at William & Mary or at CNU or at any of the places that in other countries, in Europe, for example, it would be without question that I could get from the capital city to a university that's nearby in a pretty consistent and timely manner. So ultimately, that's what the kind of like picture is. If you want to go and check it out, the third working group contribution to the AR6 or the sixth assessment report dropped sometime. I think it was like last week. What is time anyway now? Um, but uh, if you want to go through it, there's a link here. Carbonbrief.org is a really dependable source for interpretation of what these thousand page reports really are saying. 
So if you want to learn more about that, please do so. But what does that mean? So climate change going on globally, stripes got red. What does that mean here in Virginia? Um, luckily for us, there is a national climate assessment, kind of like the global, uh, the IPCC report is global. The national climate assessment is local. Uh, the fourth national climate assessment came out in 2018. I'm really fortunate to say that I've been selected and have been responsible for the uh, Southeast chapter for the fifth national climate assessment, which will come out at the end of next year, which is super exciting. Um, but basically, Virginia is sandwiched between the upper northern reaches of the Southeast and the southern reaches of the Northeast. We call that region the Mid-Atlantic, which is more geographically real realistic, but they're not going to make one more chapter about an even smaller area, no matter how much we kick and scream. But what I can do for you is take all these big reports about these two regions and distill them down into five emojis. <clears throat> <laughs> the, 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 the impacts of a changing climate on the Southeast and Northeast Mid-Atlantic Basically, we need to be preparing for a hotter, wetter, sneezier, and wheezier climate. Now, we'll get into the hotter, um, you know, like an 87 degree day uh, in early April uh, kind of day uh, in, in, for the rest of the talk. But really quickly, you know, as you may know, uh, wetter in the sense that sea levels are rising, ice sheets melt as it gets warmer, that puts water into the ocean that wasn't there before. Um, that as the ocean warms up, it actually fills a greater volume. So there's a steric response or the heat response for seawater. And then locally here in the Hampton Roads region, well, a little bit further east, land is sinking for a variety of different reasons. Very hyper locally because of water extraction for uh, things like paper uh, and then relaxation of the Earth's crust from the end of the Ice Age and the forming of the Chesapeake Bay from a, a collision or an extraterrestrial collision. Um, but anyway, sea levels going up, inundating more and more of our communities uh, slowly over time. There are some projections of how quickly it can happen. Mostly the rapidity of that rise is predicated on how sensitive the ice sheets are, how much of a kick do they get um, from the climate system, and how quickly they respond. Wetter also, not just from the sea levels, but as the air warms up, as the global atmosphere warms up, it scales with the ability to hold more water. So it's called the clausius clacheron relation. If you wanted to know more about that, that's kind of the physical relationship between the temperature of air and its water vapor content or its ability to hold water vapor. I like to say the atmosphere, uh, when it rains really hard, it's like a, you know someone hitting you over the top of the head with a water balloon. Climate change makes the water balloon much bigger. And so what that does is cascading impacts on our infrastructure, the kinds of things that we're used to this water balloon and now they have to deal with this kind of water balloon. No bueno. Sneezier and wheezier. Sneezier, I don't have to explain that to anybody. Today's the day your car is covered in yellow sludge. It is um, uh, fascinating that research that we performed at the Science Museum of Virginia digitizing the 34 years of handwritten counts of tree pollen from an allergist that operates in the city of Richmond has shown that the peak tree pollen day, it's kind of like what's going on outside right now, has moved earlier into the year by about a week and a half. And the amount that she counted on that peak day has increased by about 25%. So much so that the average peak day now is to the point where even people that are not clinically allergic experience symptoms. So if you're going outside, you're kind of watering, you're sneezing, you're coughing, and you don't usually take like allergy or allergic rhinitis medications, that is a symptom of a stronger pollen content in the air. That's probably due to a longer, earlier growing season, moving earlier, you know, the spring gets warmer sooner, uh, but also CO2 fertilization, presumably. And then wheezier climate. Does anybody remember those strange sunsets that we had over the summer last year? Maybe they weren't as uh, vivid here, uh, but Smoke from wildfires in Canada and the Western North America subsided uh, in a, a kind of like your atmospheric river of air uh, went down in the air and closer to the ground here. And that made for the first time in 15, 20 years, the worst air quality day for particulate matter in Richmond since like 2003. It was the first day that we'd had such high PM values. 
Um, so even things very far away that we have no control over, like a wildfire burning hotter and bigger because of climate change, 3,000 miles away, has an impact on our respiratory health here. And we know that, especially for that seizure and wheezier impact, those disproportionately affect people with things like pre-existing health conditions related to respiratory issues, as well as children. Children breathe more volume of air per unit body mass than adults do. So they actually are breathing in relatively more of that sneezier and wheezier air than we are, uh, which shows and helps shine a light on patterns of early childhood allergies and illness related to seasonal rhinitis. But that's all that other stuff. I'm here to talk about the hotter um, climate of the future. Uh, you might not know this, but extreme heat kills more people in the United States than any other weather-related hazard, even more so than things like flooding, tornadoes, and hurricanes. Hurricanes get on the news all the time. And why is that? I think it's because it's easier to communicate a process like a hurricane, which is discrete in space and time. You can watch it move across your screen. You can wait for it because of the cone of uncertainty. You can buy out all the toilet paper and milk and bread at the store. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast that with extreme heat waves. We have relative thresholds for what even is a heat wave from place to place. Particular National Weather Service uh, uh, areas like here is Wakefield has a different threshold for what an extreme heat event is than a place like Baltimore or, or Maine or Chicago or Portland. And so it's very hard to communicate the risk and spatial extent of an extreme heat wave. So it makes it really hard for hazard mitigation of that threat. Now, extreme heat, um, by basically any measure, I'm going to show you four boxes. Each one has a, another uh, box, a bar chart, represented. Each one of these charts has decades from the 60s to the present. And then each one is a different metric related to extreme heat. From frequency, the number of heat events has gone up considerably. The duration of those heat events has gone up the occurrence of their season, when they can even happen. You can imagine if the spring is happening earlier and the fall is lasting a little bit longer, that means the heat season has kind of bulged out over the edges than when it was usually happening. And then on top of that, the actual intensity, the, the uh, temperatures above a particular threshold have gotten more intense. And we know from history that extreme heat doesn't affect everyone the same everywhere. In 1995, in the city of Chicago, um, uh, there was a heat wave that drove temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for over 40 hours in a weekend. Temperatures didn't dip below 80 degrees overnight for several nights in a row. 750 people around 750 people died. Now, what's really interesting is that if you just hear that number, what, what are we leaving out? Where those people lived and who they were. Eric Kleinenberg, in his book, Heat Wave, if you want to read an incredibly strong sociological analysis of a weather disaster, Eric Kleinenberg's book is one of those that does it exceptionally well. He basically delves into where do these people live, the southwestern side of the city. Who were these people? Elderly members of uh, communities of color, predominantly. Those southwestern uh, uh, neighborhoods in this, in this part of Chicago had relatively higher mortality rates than whiter and wealthier communities throughout the city. Now, he also points to a lack of social infrastructure or cohesion in the sense of these elderly folks didn't have people looking out for them. They didn't have someone to come over and check on them, to give them cold water, to give them a fan, to open their windows. So. There is something underneath the threat of a, of a heat wave that is disproportionately impacting those of us that are more marginalized and forgotten about or intentionally left out uh, of social services and things like that. And I have to reflect that this picture was taken 10 miles from where I lived at this time. And in fact, I was having a good time that weekend. My family had a yard party. I it participated in slip and sliding. I had ice cream pops and we had air conditioning. My family 
couldn't have cared less that there was a heat wave going on. And so I have to reflect on that as now being a white male climate scientist that has benefited from systems that protect wealthier, whiter communities at the expense of black life in cities across America, that I bring to this that personal experience that shocks me now as I see this photo, understanding the context of my own family and my situational, um, uh, my positionality to that. Now, okay, heat waves getting worse, heat waves disproportionately impact marginalized communities. And we know that heat doesn't affect the same place the same way everywhere. So if we were gonna take this whole class when, and the door shuts and we're now on the magic school bus, we're gonna fly into this picture. I am now Mrs. Frizzle, Mr. Frizzle, whoever. You are gonna go on a scavenger hunt and you are going to go to the hottest spot to the touch. Don't say it out loud. Hold it in, and on three, we're all gonna say it at the same time. Where you're gonna to go to touch the hottest spot. Where is the hottest spot in this picture? On three, say it out loud so we don't get embarrassed about saying it by ourselves. One, two, three. Awesome, okay, okay. How about the coolest spot to the touch? On three, say it out loud. One, two, three. That's amazing. Did you hear how much more of a consensus there was in the coolest spot than there was in the hottest spot? I think there's something like evolutionarily psychological about just knowing that you want to be here on a hot day and not, you know, somewhere else in this photo. I also tell a funny joke that's more specific to Richmond when I say the coolest spot. You can't use the music venue that's in this uh, picture <laughs> called the Broadberry, uh, but that doesn't really work as well for people that live out here. Anyway, um, so we can actually assess your hypothesis. You, know, you didn't get the, the scientist from the science museum out here and not expect to do a little bit of science. So we can actually use scientific tools like thermal cameras to tell us more about this landscape. So I'm gonna reveal what the thermal photo of this landscape looks like so we can test what you said. Brighter colors, hotter temperatures. So the asphalt parking lot, especially this one particular repaved area, freshly repaved, very dense, very low albedo, meaning it is absorbing more of the sun's incoming energy that also then amplifies or is re-emitted back into the air as heat throughout the afternoon and into the evening. So this is a heavily, it's got a lot of heat capacity. On the flip side, places shade, trees, you kind of said uh, multiple times trees. Um, the quality and size of a tree has to do with the amount of cooling. Kind of like think about it as the maximizing the number of beach umbrellas that you have around you at the beach. Now, what's really interesting to me as a person that now studies urban heat islands uh, significantly is the variety of different temperatures between those two extremes. This is non-native yard lawn grass. <laughs> These are native Virginia plants. They have much deeper tap roots. Locally native plants have much deeper tap roots that allow them to bring groundwater up from lower uh, uh, places in the ground to actually then evapotranspire, kind of like plant sweating. The non-native grasses are as hot as the sidewalk. That tells you something about like what, how where do you find lots of lawn? Then there are things like the um, this this really dense white marble that we use for these structures. That uh, metamorphic rock. Uh, <laughs> I still I still got it, friends. Um, the uh, but that is so reflective. Uh, that it is actually cooler than all of the other building materials in this photo. And then finally, the cars. Lovely, lovely cars. Um, you know, these kind of lighter colored soccer family vans you can see <laughs> stick out. Darker colors, of course, it's all a question of albedo. They're all generally made of the same material, so you can see the impact of their color on their surface temperature. Now, if you were going to like use this, I could teach an entire course. Yes. What's the temperature range across here? So the white would be what versus the you know dark purple. Yeah. So this is close to like, I mean, couldn't really put the 100 and 
2030. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting pretty hot up there. This is about 75, 80 degrees. So we're we're a huge range, and that's you know um, the the exact uh, temperature. This 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 is a camera that will stick onto my phone. Not perfectly calibrated, but that difference about like 40 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty common in these kind of uh, uh, surface temperature differences at the scale of a parking lot next to a big giant tree. Now, that doesn't necessarily tell us what the temperature, where these people are walking, what temperature are they feeling? That is the integration of all of this. You can think of this as being very sharp on edges, right? You can see the individual temperatures from each individual surface. The air temperature is the earth blowing over that surface. So the more of this that you have versus this can have a direct impact on the overlying air temperature indices. And that's where we get into the complexities of measuring what is known as the urban heat island effect, where human built surfaces are absorbing and re-emitting more of the sun's energy back into the air as heat throughout the afternoon and into the evening. We can assess that using satellites that are floating around in space um, looking down at the Earth's surface, much like the camera that I had on my phone, they have thermal sensors that can see the Earth's skin temperature. But it's like, well, I like to call satellites, and, and if you're a remote sensing geographer, you're going to be mad at me about this. But if I take my glasses off, I can see there are a bunch of people in this room, but I can't tell any of the specific details that would tell me who you are or you know, the kind of like the color of your eyes and those sorts of things that are really, really important when we're talking about the temperature differences within an urban environment. So satellites can tell us a lot about the whole area that we might be concerned about, but they're so far away, they have such low detail that it's really hard for us to resolve the kind of block by block kinds of interventions that we might wanna then put into a place. More traditionally, urban heat islands were assessed using ground weather stations. So like the airport versus the rural station outside or the station in downtown versus the station in the rural area. That's actually how they were discovered in the 1800s. Luke Wilson uh, discovered it in, in uh, London using a thermometer that he had downtown versus one out in the rural area. Or we could do something that kind of tries to do both. Put a bunch of weather of uh, 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 observation equipment on vehicles, bikes, and on people, and then go around the city all at the same time during a heat wave and take measurements all at the same time. My colleague Vivek Shandas, who's at Portland State University, picked this kind of method up from David Saylor, who did work on this in the 2000s. And basically what we do now is we put these thermometers that look like if you're an enthusiastic sports fan, you know, William & Mary fan, it has one of those car flags, you know, but take the flag off and make it about science, um, that air goes through that little T-joint and it, and it stimulates a little uh, thermocouple wire that sends a signal down to a data logger. It takes a measurement every single second of the air temperature. Meanwhile, um, inside the car, we have a GPS unit that's keeping track of where you are in space every single second. So when you plot those two things on top of each other in GIS, we have a really highly detailed description of how temperatures vary across a person's traverse around a city. So we combine a whole bunch of different things from the uh, cars to the bikes to people walking. And then we actually relate those observations to land use, uh, remotely sensed land use data uh, that's at a higher resolution than our surface temperatures can be. So I'll tell you about uh, what we did in Richmond, kind of, again, the moving around in a different way. Um, let's, the application of this um, uh, in Richmond in 2017. We teamed up with a whole bunch of different groups. I want to tell you really fast, if you're interested in learning more about what kind of climate action is happening from the city level in Richmond, um, go to, to rbagreen2050.com. They really make use of these data and others uh, to frame climate change around uh, social and environmental justice issues uh, in Richmond, which is really great, alongside the desire to reach net zero by 2050. Meanwhile, you've got the city level, and then you've got the on the ground groups that really make this kind of data work are like Groundwork RVA, which is part of a national network of groundwork trusts with the mission to green Richmond, prepare youth for success, improve health and quality of life for all while realizing racial equity. This was a group that when I met them, 
they were doing climate action and climate programs without realizing that they were climate action people. And so our collaboration is now an award-winning collaboration um, and we continue to marshal more and more resources to the to climate action in Richmond together. And uh, in 2017, it was July, it was hot. It felt like you were walking around outside with somebody else's mouth. Uh, we put on thermometers all over these cars. I was really stupid and rode my bike, um, nearly gave myself heat stroke. Uh, and this is what our data kind of looked like. If you're not familiar with Richmond, here's the James River, here's downtown. Uh, the Science Museum is up here, and then um, the kind of uh, Arthur Ashe Boulevard is along here. And so uh, we, have, we observed a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place at the exact same time. And many of those hottest spots were these really wide streets with not very big buildings next to it. So really exposed uh, uh, human surfaces. Meanwhile, the really cool places were really densely shaded urban parks. Now you might say it's because you're close to the river, but it's actually it doesn't really have anything to do with that at all. Um, and the, uh, the urban area, if you think to yourself like, oh, the urban heat island effect, it must be the downtown that's the hottest. Actually, what we found and we've confirmed in the many dozens of campaigns since that the urban canyon effect, those big tall buildings actually shade those places in the downtown. So your air temperature in the afternoon is depressed in the urban core and actually higher in places where you just have really wide arterial streets with really short buildings nearby and not a lot of trees. So when we put that into our methodology, this is what the map of Richmond looks like when you um, uh, get, get a prediction of what the temperatures are based on the land use. And you might say like, all right, well, so what do you do with this information? We started uh, the conversation talking about impacts on health. So let's take a look at what the health uh, implications of this are. Um, the heat, extreme heat map from 2017, what I'm going to show you is a map of where the ambulance goes for heat-related illnesses during the summer. The correspondence of these two maps even uh, continues even when you correct for things like population density, um, uh, which is probably the most important. And um, what's really a incredible kind of correspondence where there are clusters of uh, high rates of heat related illnesses in places that near mimic um, uh, the, the, the patterns of extreme heat. Now, uh, the, uh, the uh, thing that I told you about also is if I just say more people get sick when it's hot out, I'm leaving out what well, we just saw where they get sick and now who is it? But 60% of the cases for heat related illnesses responded to by the ambulance are for black individuals in the city of Richmond, but they only make up about half the population. That disparate impact is a clear environmental justice uh, uh, situation and the uh, corresponding lower uh, incidence of it in white individuals versus their uh, about 50% of the population identifies that as well. Now, what we started doing was looking at why why? Because we've seen this in a lot of different um, cities, individually seeking to understand what was going on. Uh, collaborations with uh, some of our colleagues in Richmond started to see the fact that this heat vulnerability map or the heat, the heat map itself was looking like every other map in Richmond of virtually every other social census data that we can think of. And but what joins them all together is history. As geologists, you all know that you need to go back in time in order to understand what's going on now, right? So this is what's known as a redlining map, basically to, um, to secure the housing market from failure and the New Deal. Um, a city assessors were allowed to go around in about 250 cities around the country and assign a letter grade, much like the grades that you're getting here in, uh, in, in, at William & Mary, hopefully more of these grades than the other ones. Um, but in any case, they correspond to a like a, uh, a descending order. And in fact, the green line ones were, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the, the best neighborhoods down to D being hazardous. Now, this was supposed to be hazardous to what? Hazardous to financial investment. If you were to put a mortgage or insurance or something related to real estate in these places, then they were not going to be secure investments. But the green places were. Definitely give those people money. Now, that was supposed to be about a perceived or some sort of, um, some sort of objective rating about their um, security, but it really had more to do with who lived there. 
here in Richmond, um, uh, Jackson Ward neighborhood, uh, famous for being the Harlem of the South. Uh, the first black owned woman run bank in American history was found, founded there by Maggie Walker. Uh, the only description written down on the, on the redlining uh, notes for that neighborhood was 100% Negro. That was the only thing that they said. Meanwhile, A5 over here, where a castle was moved piece by piece from England to Richmond, Virginia, um, uh, there uh, was the description of who was living there. The best people, of course. So this had, and if you look at not just Richmond, but around the South, really had more to do with the racial or ethnic makeup of the neighborhoods, much more than a, uh, uh, an objective view of their uh, capacity for financial investment. Where the Capitol is? Uh, the Capitol building would be somewhere over here, a little bit, maybe a little bit more up. Okay. Yeah. And, um, but across the country, uh, in places where there weren't as many African American communities, um, there uh, it really was more along the lines of their immigrant status. So you see, like Ukrainians, you see Irish people, you see um, uh, uh, Asian immigrants being uh, redlined. It's basically like anybody that wasn't uh, part of the part of the the the, the home team uh, was given a, a a poor or a rating, and so. We wanted to ask, or well, and this has had measurable economic impacts. So this paper from January 2021, among others, was able to show that growing up on the lower graded side of a map border had negative effects for several decades after the maps were drawn. So this is like your family and your kids and your grandkids and their kids continually have negative impacts about related to these, um, the, the drawing of these maps. And so we wanted to ask, what were the environmental conditions? Can we pull anything useful out about the environmental conditions? And so these are the words that were used to describe, describe the A and B neighborhoods. Shade, wooded, rolling, well shaded, and gulf. Of course, I mean, a lot of these A rated neighborhoods were near, um, Kind of famous uh, uh, country clubs and still remain that way. Now, on the C and D neighborhood side, this is where you see things like paved, hot, odors, manufacturing, sewers, plants, mines, industry, hazard, it's airport, it is the uh, codification of environmental disparity in front of us. And so if you want to know a little bit more about what happened even before that, because there, it, that, that was the description of that at that time in the 1930s and 40s. What came before that? I implore you to go and watch this TED Talk by Stephen DeBerry, where he, among other uh, scholars, um, start to talk and dismantle residential sorting patterns. And it might be due to just the spin of the earth itself that we have some of these things playing out in our city. So definitely check that one out. But the paper that we published about this was featured on the front page of the New York Times, which was really cool for me, um, but also cool, not cool in the sense of what we were showing as a pun. Um, so the formerly redlined areas in Richmond significantly warmer than their non-redlined counterparts. Um, this plays out uh, in land use. The underlying land use is exactly what you saw in that photo. Those places tend to be more heavily paved over and they have many fewer trees. Those things that you yourselves had hypotheses about uh, from that picture outside. Now, when we amalgamate all of the maps across the country, 108 different places, formerly redlined areas are about five degrees warmer during the summer than their non-redlined neighbors. These places tend to be much more paved over by and large across the country and have many fewer trees. That varies by region. Um, and the South has the largest disparity in tree canopy and impervious surface. And Chattanooga, Tennessee was among the cities with the highest uh, temperature differences that we were able to see in these remotely sensed temperature data. Now, since then, our results have been largely confirmed. I'm not gonna go into much detail about what these graphs are showing, but the, uh, it, I mean, now there's been a litany of different papers published from different perspectives. And I find actually it's the more, um, more uh, just, uh, qualitative uh, assessments that are more uh, captivating for me. This is from Birmingham, Alabama, grade D areas just from satellite imagery. You can see 
just how different of, an, of a quality of the, the scenery of being in these two different neighborhoods would be like. And we know so much now about the benefits of being around green things. It makes you heal faster. It gives you more economic boosts. There's uh, uh, more open space, more activity, lower obesity. All these different predictors of long-term health are related to the greenness of where you grow up. Now, we also know some interesting things about, remember when I said those bigger trees had more of an impact than the smaller ones? Formerly green-lined areas have bigger, more efficient trees than the formerly red-lined areas. And this plays out across Virginia. We have data now specifically to Virginia to show this exact same thing happening. We're working on a paper on it. Um, but everything that we know about the ecosystem services that a tree benefit or tree gives us uh, is significantly reduced because of this. And this, you know, if you're like a tree person, you probably think like, well, these formerly redlined areas are more paved over, so there's less soil for the trees to grow healthfully. Also, they probably receive less municipal dollars to keep the health the trees healthy. Or, you know, and the formerly green lined areas had big shady lots. Remember, they were described as wooded. These are probably extremely mature trees on top of being um, well cared for. Now, we uh, this is the to turn the conversation here in the last uh, little bit that we have together to, it's not just heat, because if it was just heat, then there wouldn't be much of a story. Because what did we say about the impacts of climate change? Hotter, wetter, sneezier, and wheezier. So I tricked you. I said we were only going to talk about the hotter thing. But when we look at a map like this, this is the flood factor score from the Front Street Foundation, the First Street Foundation. Anywhere on this map that's blue is underestimated for their flood risk in current FEMA maps. Um, this is just one example of a data set like this. It incorporates both its urbanity and future levels of extreme precipitation. And so you can see at the county level, there are some areas that are significantly underestimated for their present day risk of flooding. And what I did with them was to ask, hey, if you were to overlay your risk map, your parcelized risk map with these redlining maps, what do you get as far as the number of parcels or the percentage of parcels in those areas that are high flood risk? Perhaps unsurprisingly, the formerly redlined areas ex uh, experience a higher percentage of their parcels that are exposed to extreme or high flood risk in cities around the country. And it seems like when we compare the, the flood risk outside of the HULC map barriers, on average, the treatment is there. So again, like talking about the socioeconomics and having a decade, like multi-year impact, we're starting to work out the causality piece of, um, of these maps using flood data. Okay, that's the wetter. What about the sneezier and wheezier? Well, a paper came out just two or three weeks ago showing that formerly redlined areas experience a higher burden of one of the key predictors of the EPA's air, core air quality index, known as NO2. So if you know anything about urban planning history, this isn't a surprise because in the decades following redlining, in the many decades of decisions that were made after that, urban renewal programs used the redlining maps and other forms of uh, social, social mapping like that to determine where we were going to put the interstate. So in Richmond, for example, the 6495 interchange bulldozed portions of Jackson Wharf to make room for cars. And so the remaining residents in the parts that weren't bulldozed are now closer to the key pollutant vector for poor air quality, which is traffic. So um, we were talking again, it's the, the hotter, wetter, sneezier, and wheezier all seem to be a present day difference. It's not the future. We're talking about right now. Now, it's more than just the environment. There are some other things that have come out that are pretty interesting. Louisville um, showed that there was a higher incidence of gun violence in these formerly uh, redlined areas. Um, and there's also uh, some things regarding uh, the implications of action. So this is Philadelphia. This is a confusing graph, so I'll spend just a little bit of time on it. Um, the dots correspond to how much green infrastructure or these investments that cities can make in creating climate resilient um, uh, sorts of things like rain gardens 
or a new park that will absorb stormwater or some sort of uh, basically it's, it's some related to um, soaking up and cooling down. Okay. And so anywhere that has more of it has a bigger circle. Now the colors correspond to a particular subpopulation of people. Black population in the blue to red on this one, and the Hispanic population from green to red on that one. The color corresponds to how much change that particular area of the city has seen uh, over the last 20 years or so in the population. So what this paper conjectures is that investments made in, in, in green infrastructure, these climate resilient infrastructures in Philadelphia have contributed to the displacement of the people living there also known as green gentrification. So if you don't pair your investments where we put money with policies that also secure the long-term residences of the people that live there, you may intent unintentionally displace them into places that have fewer environmental amenities. So you're in effect creating a new red line. So I'm going to switch over to the good stuff. What is going on now that we can say confidently in some ways is a positive? What do we do? Well, in 2021, in the summer, we put together a 10-city urban heat island campaign led by the Virginia Foundation of Independent Colleges. We recruited 200, over 200 volunteers uh, across 10 cities to make over close to a half million observations of temperature across urban environments in Virginia. So we now have the most detailed understanding of heat exposure of any state in the United States because of volunteer citizen or community science going on in cities all over uh, Virginia. Partially su uh, uh, supported by investments from Capital One, the Department of Forestry. Um, there was supposed to be some money in the Department of Forestry budget to do this even more if an uh, intrepid undergraduate researcher would want to lead something similar to this. In Williamsburg, uh, I, can, I know the Department of Forestry head that would want to talk to you. We've been able to scale this model, this, camp, this community science heat campaign up to the extent that NOAA and the National Integrated Heat Health Information System is now supporting campaigns all over the country. I've been really fortunate to watch my experiment in Richmond get copy and pasted in dozens of cities around the country. And each one of these cities has its unique story of what happens next. That's really what's invigorating about this, is that in Jackson, Mississippi, the two degrees Celsius uh, community justice or environmental justice community group that led the campaign is doing something very different from uh, the community in Richmond, Indiana, or Detroit, Michigan, or Burlington, Vermont. The regionality of this, that's really what climate change action is about, is understanding the local context for any decision making around it. And that's what these data do. They allow you to make these kinds of hyper-localized uh, community-based decisions such that you could start marshalling some resources to those ideas. We've now gotten a, a close to you know, a, over a million dollars in federal funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and NOAA to, to do community-based projects in Richmond that are informed by the residents that live in those communities. What kind, do you want trees? That's a question that they've never been asked before. What do you want to do? What can we do together? There's some urban agriculture groups that are active in these communities. And in fact, that's the big story of my new grant at the city of in, at the Science Museum. We're funding four community-based organizations, including our old um, collaborators, Groundwork RBA, in doing that kind of community-based, uh, we're calling it the Richmond Climate Resilience Forum. Uh, and we've interviewed 24 community members about their experiences related to heat and flooding, and their uh, perspectives are being uh, 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 kind of uh, presented among resilient strategies from the RVA Green 2050 Climate Action Plan. And then these community groups will actually then be able to do a project in their neighborhood related to the outcomes of those events. So I'm super thrilled uh, to be a part of that. Um, second to last thing that I'll share, um, the mayor, uh, for the first time since the 1970s, 
transferred surplus public land owned by the city to the parks department to become green spaces for communities in Richmond South Side, which were formerly red line communities, as well as communities that were part of the annexation of Chesterfield County, which was then uh, uh, made illegal by the Supreme Court. And it was a move by the city to dilute the black vote in places like Jackson Ward. Um, so uh, there's a lot of reparational kind of things that we need to do for Southside Richmond. Um, and this is just one small thing. Uh, the Parks Department is researching ways and policies to secure the uh, individuals in those communities where these investments will be made um, to ensure that there's no uh, extreme right hike in their market value of their homes, for example. Last thing, uh, Science Museum of Virginia. The, uh, here's the, the, the building, beautiful place. That's the parking lot that you saw in that picture. Um, we tore it up and we're changing it from a parking lot and turning it into a park, which is no. awesome. Yeah. And um, we don't worry, we didn't get rid of the parking. We just, <laughs> we just made it into a parking deck. So we built a smaller, um, taller parking space uh, holder um, for uh, more parking than we had before. And now we get to make this park, which is really amazing. So come and see it. Finally, this is, I've used this um, a few different times, but climate change, you know, our policies need to be comprehensive. They need to be all about the full range of things related to people's lives. It can't just be, you know, planting trees. It needs to also address these other very important inequities that we see across our, 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 our communities, uh, in my opinion. Um, so that's where I'll stop. Let's have a conversation. Thanks very much for your attention. Nice to see you, Chris. Same. Take it easy. Yes. Do we know exactly why marble motion reflects in the office? This is for anybody to answer. This is an open question. I'm curious. Does anybody want to take a take a stab? I, I, I don't hear enough. It's it's about the marble being able to reflect in the office. It doesn't seem to take any I'm curious as to why. What do you think is going on? If you if you had to guess at the key reason based on what we saw in that picture. You know, there was something about the material, right? Then there was something about the naturalness or like the amount of trees. What was the other thing, like the cars and the surfaces themselves? Um, or maybe another way to think about it. What if we had a, a balustrade made of basalt right next to it? Is it, is it kind of just the, uh, I'm sorry, is it kind of just the Yes. Yeah, that's the main One. thing going on there. There's something probably also I haven't done like you know it'd be sweet to just get an infrared like uh, like a like a light you know like a heat lamp for a lizard or something and like shine it on different rocks <laughs> in the in the collection or something. You know, but I know it's it, it's an alarmed system, so um, we, we we can't open the cases. But maybe the things that you're using in Ignat Pet um, and you do some tests. Other questions? There might be a question. Are there any questions on the internet in the in the digital people? Yes. Um, have you been able to convince any other institutions in Richmond to change up their parking situation? Because I don't really get that So while I haven't been able to um, convince, it's not been my me talking to them. The work that uh, the NIFWIF grant, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that got funded, that was for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, collaborated with a few South Side churches. Churches on the South Side have huge, empty parking lots. And so by collaborating with these faith communities, they were like, hey, we can probably lower your stormwater bill, which is based on the level of imperviousness, by changing that into something else, what would you like? And it was like, well, we can definitely get rid of most of it. So now they're depaving parking lots to plant trees, rain gardens, and urban farm spaces to do that. So while it wasn't me necessarily, I'm happy that the work that we've done has led to that decision 
for faith communities. This is actually, faith communities have been leading more than the big institutions. Other example, the city of Richmond has in big projects like the Diamond District, which is where the, the Squirrels uh, baseball stadium is right now, that whole parcel is being redeveloped over the next few years. And as part of that, there are uh, direct references to our heat island work as ways to make you, the, those develops, developments more environmentally sustainable. Right now, that whole area is just parking lots or grass. So it, is, it has been cool to, um, and pun intended, to watch that going on um, you know, in, in places. But yeah, what we're hoping is that this can be an example for many other places, especially with, you know, if you can, if you can put a smaller, taller parking area, you know, um, you can have more open space. And that's probably the kind of responsible land use that we want moving forward. Yes. So at one point when you're showing the heat island map of Richmond, you talked about how the river didn't have much of an effect. I'm curious about why the river didn't have much of an effect. So there are there are um, there are hypotheses about how big a water body needs to be before it starts to create a onshore breeze. And so basically it's about whether or not it's large enough to influence local uh, subsidy, yeah, uh, uh, um, convergence. Uh, and so like Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Okafoji or Okeechobee, um, maybe even Walden Pond we've seen in our Boston campaign might have had a little bit of it. So, but most of the time those are larger, non-moving bodies of water. And as far as we can tell, like a, a river that's that size just isn't big enough. But, you know, I, we have had some arguments that like the Mississippi on the right day has enough fetch to serve as its own air conditioner. But um, yeah, it, it's just not wide enough. And at that time of year, the flow is so low, the yeah, water is actually yeah, pretty close to the air temperature. Yeah. 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 So is it buildings or trees that were making it cooler? Yeah, so, well, it's a little bit of both. So you can have um, really big mature trees that create a bunch of shade and the more of those around each other is the bigger the, the temperature drop, as well as a bunch of blocks with the right kind of geometry. So think about it, we're in the Northern hemisphere. So the sun is always in the Southern part of the sky. So on an East West street with South, on the South side of that street with tall buildings casts the most efficient shadow. So anywhere that you could find that arrangement, you had a, a lowering of the te air temperature. Uh, and that's actually one of the urban design uh, aspects that we could actually employ. Like if we knew that we were going to have a pedestrianized street somewhere and you wanted that to be climate friendly or non heat inducing, you would probably zone it for higher buildings on the south side of that east west street to create shade canyons where you want them the most during the summer. So um, it's really amazing, like the kind of urban form discussions you can start to have around this, because it really means like there's a certain geometry, there's a certain density, more variation in buildings creates more surface roughness, which then increases the turbulence. Then you can put more trees in particular places, move a body of water. Then we're starting to combine all of what we can learn from those maps all at once into like, in the ideal sense, a climate resilient or heat resilient city. What does that look like? It has these following types of um, uh, design principles. But do those, do, those, do those design principles then overlap with things like transportation access, you know, all these other things that we need to mitigate climate change. So it's a really uh, uh, amazing kind of like mind game that you can play about designing your own city. It needs to be a game. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know you guys did the heat map in 2017. So do you guys like update the heat map after that? I didn't spend time on that today, but we actually did Richmond again this past summer. So we did an update to Richmond. Um, there were some places that, uh, well, and it's hard to compare them apples to apples because it was a different, it was a different meteorological context. So the day in 2017 was much hotter to begin with. To begin with, it was like oh, well over 100 degrees. 
And the day that we did in 2021, 2021 didn't break 100. So the, and it was a little smoky and hazy in 2021. So what is smoke and haze attenuates solar energy reaching the ground? So without all that solar energy going into all those surfaces, you dampen the differences between land use types. So anyway, where we can see large changes in the standard deviation of temperatures were places where we've removed forested land to build a mall, a strip mall, a parking lot, and some big multifamily housing that's surrounded by parking lots. So again, it's always about where has land use shifted from a, a more traditional or a more uh, uh, natural landscape to a more human landscape? And then what does that human landscape have about it that makes temperatures hotter? And it's mostly has to do with parking lots, roads, no trees, short buildings. Yeah, it's a good question. Any other questions for Jeremy? Thank you, that was wonderful.